Act, uh, and and that was basically concealed by the the celebrations and the fireworks and all that. The the um, Winter Games uh, in uh, Oslo in Lillehammer that they created a, an environment where everybody was looking the other way and, and criminals themselves are uh, have in the past mm -hmm. uh, developed those um diversions uh, it, again in norway i think they set fire to some cars blew some cars up to distract emergency uh responders away from it uh th there there have been quite a few examples of uh, professional criminals who are targeting a uh, particular venue, venue to create the environment where something else is happening. The, I mean, the biggest art theft in history in Boston um, was St. Patrick's Day in, in Boston, which um, I don't know if any of, any of you have attended it. It's, uh, yeah, it makes um, the Commonwealth Games look like a, a tea dance so uh, that those elements will be used by criminals to affect their their activity and it's down to us to recognize that in advance and say these are some of the measures that we need to make sure are in place uh, and it's the the old adage of of physical security technical security and making sure your organization is um, is prepared and fit for purpose and, and I'm sure this is something that perhaps not these exact circumstances, but it sounds like institutions, you know, the, the responsible ones at least have plans in place for things like this, and then it's a matter of implementing them. Yeah. Now, the, the challenges are slightly different, of course, for, for archaeological sites. Um, Donna, in addition to your work as an academic, you've done work on the ground uh, to combat the illicit trade. And... Um, Indeed, some of our colleagues in the field have warned that with, with tourists at home, criminals in some ways have free range, especially at remote sites, to engage in illegal metal detecting or, or other illicit excavation. And something that we've been following closely at the Antiquities Coalition is that in the United States, uh, at least, treasure hunting, treasure hunting companies are, are already incorporating this into advertising. And saying that metal detecting is, I quote, the safest thing that you can do in a pandemic. Have some fun, never have to be in contact with anyone, you and your loved ones <laughs> and the great outdoors. So as an American who's also lived a lot in the UK, which um, I believe has a much more active metal detecting population than we do, I, was, I was, would love to hear your thoughts on this because we, again, found it very interesting. The advertisers are already on it. Well, in, indeed, metal detecting is certainly a socially distant hobby. Um, it is not for everyone to, to walk through wet fields alone listening to beeping and um, is not necessarily something one can casually pick up. But I, I think it's interesting that this is being advertised as such. Um, the interesting thing about metal detecting in the UK and other places is that there are perfectly legal ways to do it. Um, I, as an archaeologist, other archaeologists or commentators may not really like the practice, but as, as long as it's done in a legal way, um, the, the, the criticism remains um, social and academic. You're, if you're not breaking the law, there, there's a, not a lot of practical argument I, I can supply against mm -hmm. it. However, at, at least within the UK, which is where I know the most about metal detecting, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge of the, the right and legal way to, to do metal detecting is transmitted interpersonally. It's, mm -hmm. it's done through joining a metal detecting club or organization. It's done through attending a, a metal detecting rally or other event. And perhaps most importantly, it's done through the outreach of fines liaison officers um, within uh, England and the, the treasure trove unit within Scotland. Mm -hmm. So professional archaeologists who are there to interact with uh, people who are using metal detectors and to, to keep them on the right side of the law. 
um, to casually pick this up, to, to, to basically casually enter uh, a, a, a field that it, where it's so easy to to make a mistake, to potentially break the law, to detect in the wrong place, in the wrong way, to um, to locate the kind of material that you have to report to somebody, to know who to report to. All of this stuff is very complicated and isn't really picked up casually. Yeah. Um, to, to, to buy a, a metal detector off eBay and then go out into a field uh, is, is a pretty, pretty risky thing to do. Uh, if you're doing that with your whole family, you might end up with your kids watching you be arrested. <laughs> so, so I, it's, it's the kind of thing that if, if somebody's wanting to pick up metal detecting for whatever their reasons may be, it, it's, it's risky business to, to, to pick up without this this kind of interpersonal interaction and that kind of those kind of meetings and so on just aren't going on right now. Yeah, no, no. Interesting questions raised by that, and and something that we've been promoting at the Antiquities Coalition is buyer beware for those who might be thinking about purchasing antiquities and want to do so in a responsible way. But it sounds like metal detector beware would be a, a good campaign as well. Um, on a somewhat lighter note, Vernon, those of us who are lucky enough to follow you on Twitter, and for everyone out there, it's at Vernon Rapley, so he's easy to find. We have been following your adventures in a now mostly empty v &A museum, and I have to say the images are, are pretty surreal and fascinating. Uh, but given that so much of, of museum security and, and of archeological site security, at least in some places as well, is dealing with the public, I would think this, the absence of the public makes your job both easier and then as, as Dennis mentioned, it's a double-edged sword. There's a lot of things that are harder right now too. We'd, we'd love for you to, to talk about this a little bit. Of course, it's, it's a very different dynamic because normally uh, maybe our major risks uh, are during the day um, uh, of, of someone walking in and taking an object uh, from display or from a study area or from a library. Um, and there we rely very much on our three and a half million visitors a year to be our eyes and ears. Um, of course, we've, you know, we've got a thousand CTD TV cameras, we've got, we've got dozens of guards, but probably our best defense are our public, our people. Uh, and so the dynamic shifts, of course, to when we're closed and the museums in the old days were very much open and closed. And, and at 5.45, we were closed and went home. But museums have become a much more dynamic um, uh, institutions now where they're open nearly all the time for events. And then they've got morning parties or drinks receptions and things like this. And so uh, being closed and locked down was actually something that we weren't really used to. Uh, we only close for three days of the year. Um, and even, of course, then we, we have security. So we had to think uh, differently. And in fact, to start with, we increased our security presence during the day uh, rather than de decreasing it because we didn't really understand the risks. And one of the major risks we feared was that we might not get a decent police response, that the, that the response might be longer or slower because we feared they would be distracted or even depleted in numbers. Um, and we also had to uh, assess, you know, whether we could get security officers in. At one point, there was a fear that with the lockdown, it would be so total uh, that, that we might not be able to bring our own security officers in here. So we even planned for keeping a couple of us here. Um, so, so I could have been speaking to you today, having, having been sleeping here for three months, because that was one of the plans that I would literally hoard food and sleep in the museum because I wouldn't leave it uh, unprotected. Um, this sounds like a Hollywood you, film waiting to happen. And, <laughs> and, and I feel like your Twitter account would be you, your beard growing, you're slowly going a bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's it's been um, it's it's a very surreal experience walking around the museum actually, and it's probably why you say some of these images. Uh, it, it's it, it, the, the objects just lose their life really. Um, they they're still there, but they're they're almost sleeping, and they don't. There's something about the visitors, the public, the lighting, and the ambient ambiance generally that just brings them to life. And it's yeah. quite sad actually walking around sort of ghostly halls and even the fact that the outside noise has gone you know certainly in those first few weeks of lockdown there was no aeroplanes flying there was no car noise there were the hustle and bustle of being in a major city had gone and the whole place just feels really uh, really eerie and quite and quite strange oh. now now with 
when we think of museum and site security, we're often thinking of those objects uh, that are you've been showing on your Twitter account. But a lot of the job is, is thinking about people, how to protect the public, how to protect your team. And this certainly must be true in a, a crisis like a pandemic. Um, would love to hear from, from you, Vernon or, or Dennis, how are you protecting the people who protect uh, these objects and sites right now? Um, I, I, I like to say that the idea that we have managed to maintain pretty full security presence throughout the uh, throughout the issues so far um, has been good. The security staff in London were given uh, uh, a status which allowed them to travel around and to be outside when others weren't. So they were given a uh, a key worker uh, status um, and that allowed people security staff to get in and to uh, protect those premises which of course the authorities the police service and everybody else really wanted to happen because if they weren't it could have increased their workload by having not just uh, cultural institutions and, and auction houses but other premises with high value material jewelers stores all of those places uh, have maintained levels of, of security that were the same as, as before, if not greater. In relation to protecting the people, it, it's a good question. We've had to uh, split our teams so that we've got uh, uh, teams that don't cross over much and, and they bring with them, they had a, a crate where they had their own keyboards, their own phone handsets and everything else. and and the night shift would open their crate and plug in all their keyboards and then they put them away and the day shift would come in and they would do uh, a similar thing. So we weren't cross contaminating things, but we were genuinely worried that if single points of failure, such as control rooms were badly affected and contaminated, we, we would struggle to be able to maintain um, levels of CCTV monitoring without uh, having the business continuity capability of having an alternative place to do that from. Um, so it, when we've talked about BCP in the past, and Vernon and I are, are, uh, are old hats at, uh, at, um, at banging through the difference about BCP to do with terrorist incidents, to do with various other types of incidents that could mean that you can't occupy your premises, one of the areas was, of course, how we maintain the environmental conditions. How do we get people through cordons and into spaces to look after the, the frag fragile and vulnerable objects that are, are in these places? Uh, thankfully, we have been able to maintain as reasonable business as normal within those areas about maintaining systems, making sure that the environmental conditions are maintained. Um, but a different set of circumstances could mean that we've got to address those in a different way. I think this pandemic, we've been relatively uh, fortunate uh, that uh, it has been managed how it's been managed and we haven't had the level of public order that some people thought might happen and thought that people would take to the streets. Well, they have, but for different reasons. Um, and. Um, it, we've been relatively fortunate, I think, in the in in the uh, in the way things have gone. Yeah. Vernon, do you I have actually, any oh, sorry. oh yeah, go ahead, Donna. Well, I, I was actually going to slightly change the subject back to something yeah. Vernon had said before, but if if you have uh, no, things to say on this it. topic, right? Well, I, I I actually I was really interested in in what Vernon said about the the public being such an important component of museum security and this idea of security from footfall that that security comes from people being in these spaces and using them um, and that that it's it's interesting for me to hear that that's the case for museums um, because it's very much the case for kind of other sites sites of culture archaeological sites churches temples places like that um, some some of our recent research into this idea of security from footfall has been done in Nepal 
um, after the 2015 earthquake. So another kind of jarring tragedy um, that uh, caused uh, uh, a change in the security situation mm -hmm. when it comes to the, the way police officers move through the city and so on. But what some of our research shows is it caused a change in how people use these spaces, how, how often people visit certain temples, how often people pass by certain ways, how often uh, uh, if, if a, a fruit vendor is open across the street from a heritage site. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these kind of normal everyday things that um, uh, allow people to kind of see what's going on monitor their heritage and start noting if anything is a bit weird and suspicious. Um, and in, in a way, I, I think that um, we, we often don't discuss with the public how important they are um, and how much they contribute to security. But on the other hand, at least a, a, at archeological and heritage sites after various types of tragedies, we don't do a lot to uh, support these networks after they break down or really kind of acknowledge that the the fruit vendor across the street who can't set up anymore is is not necessarily as but a different kind of important than the police officer who walks by at certain times every day just yeah, the thought you know I think it's a great thought and we have we are lucky today to have a lot of archaeologists from around the world um, who are on. And so we would love to hear from those of you in the comments um, if you have firsthand stories of what's happening at the sites at which you work or reports that you're hearing about that. And while hopefully people will start chatting there and we can share some of them if they come up that are particularly interesting. And yeah, Vernon would love to hear your, uh, your response to the point that Donna just made in response to your earlier point. Well, I think, um, you know, Donna makes a very good point. It's, it's, it's not just about museums. It's uh, archaeological sites and heritage sites are, are really important, the visitors are. I mean, we looked statistically at what percentage of visitors come in, come in with criminal intent towards your objects. And, you know, don't, don't quote me on this one, please. But we think it's about one in every 11 and a half million visitors to a museum <laughs> in London, probably. And so the vast majority of people are therefore there for good purposes. Now, we can rely upon them because I think there's a recognised structure. They know what to do if they see something that's suspicious. We will have gallery assistants in the galleries. We will have security officers. There's cameras. There's always people by the doors. Where I think there's room for improvement in the heritage sector is what do they do once they see something suspicious? Are they sure that it's a criminal offence? Do they know what to do with it? And I think that's something, again, where messaging could really be in increased so that you could plead to the public to lawful visitors or passers-by to pass that information because I think I think the public are a, a, a bigger asset really probably in, in, in those more remote sites than, than they, they are in the in, in the heritage world in the, in the museum world sorry and, and, and uh, again sort of bouncing back to that uh, the fruit vendor outside of the archaeological site it was something that we looked at some years ago with uh, a group called PMSA, the Public Monuments and Statuary Association. And uh, it, was very, uh, it was very simple about the fact that the best camouflage for a lot of these criminals is a high-vis jacket and a, mm. a, a, a truck. People just assume that that's appropriate. And when we had a lot of challenges with uh, bronze going missing, metal thefts, lead, lead off roofs, all of that sort of thing. One of the common denominators was they weren't wearing striped vests and, and uh, burglars masks. They were wearing high-vis jackets and, and workman's clothes. And what we, we did was promote the idea that opposite a lot of these, particularly war memorials, were, you know, a little newsagent shop or a, a, a grocer's or, or somebody and trying to explain to them what what right looks like and giving them a number that they could then call to help them raise awareness of it. And nine times out of 10, it may well be perfectly legitimate, but it's those times where people hide in plain view uh, and look as though they should be there. People just after the event say, well, they looked as though they were etc. So yes, that's a very important thing is to, uh, is to use your neighbours and use the people that 
that know what right looks like and, um, and, and give them the opportunity and the tools to be able to flag these things up to somebody. I, and to follow up on that, I know in the US within a number of national parks and, and areas that are um, uh, kind of public lands, there's, there's a, there's a site, site steward program. And if I've got the title of that slightly wrong, I apologize. I know someone here almost certainly knows what it's actually called if it's not the site steward program, where um, archeologists and heritage professionals within the park service or other relevant agency train local people to, to, to notice when things are a bit off. And the site stewards go to certain areas usually remote-ish areas where they walk their dogs or like they like going on hikes and they just kind of keep constant eyes on these areas with just enough training to spot when something's wrong and um, a clear contact pathway yeah, to that's the that thing. yeah the clear contact pathway really i the i'm sure that both both dennis and vernon have uh, similar experiences but the sheer number of times i'm contacted every month with people saying something's dodgy, who do, who do I get in t contact with is staggering. Usually it's not me, usually I can't do anything, so. <laughs> I think there's, a, there's an opportunity at the moment as well. There's a, de there's a definite increased interest in ownership and in cultural heritage uh, amongst young people. And uh, if, it takes me back to years ago when I worked with, uh, in Colombia and there was, a, there was a group there that set up a, a youth uh, heritage scouts uh, group and they were they were young people who were just trained to, to report and to try and to convince people in those local rural communities about the value of heritage and therefore how you know not to destroy it and where to report it uh, and I think that's there's a real opportunity in this country in the UK and probably in the US at the moment to to engage in a positive way with this with this new interest I think and um, erupting interest in, in, in heritage and heritage sites at the moment. Well, to, to follow up on the, the metal detecting question, if, if anybody out there is looking for an exciting and slightly solitary outdoor hobby with the family, perhaps become a, a site steward of some kind and go on walks to monitor these sites. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a little bit less, uh, uh, fraught with uh, possible pitfalls. Very much, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and who knows when, I mean, when this, when the foot traffic at some of these sites will, um, will increase again. We, as those of you in the audience will see that we launched a poll about when you plan on returning to a museum or cultural site. And I would think this audience in particular will be skewed toward a fast return. Um, but the results of that are 47% say as soon as they open. 34% uh, say one to three months after opening and um, close to 10 say more than six months and another 13% uh, uh, not until there's a vaccine or reliable treatment. So, you know, close to a, a fifth of people, you know, it's can't, can't say when they'll feel safe returning. Um, we've certainly seen in the headlines criminals taking uh, advantage of the current situation. I, one interesting case that I saw was in Turkey where officials caught smugglers impersonating healthcare workers. And this was, this was early on. It's like, wow, that, that was fast. Um, even a virus patient, um, archeological watchdog groups like the Athar Project have reported a growing trend of posts in Facebook groups uh, dedicated to the trade and illicit materials. And I was wondering both for our panelists and again, also those of you out there in the audience, um, have anyone has seen, seen other examples? And also, I, you know, especially with this trend of, you know, there's been a trend for a long time of, of putting illicit stolen material on the, on the internet, selling it online, are these trends going to continue? And does this open up Vernon, to your point, some opportunities as, as well as challenges. So just for anyone who would love to jump in about that. Well, first, first, <laughs> uh, the first part of the question, has anyone heard of, um, in, your, in your experience that you can talk about, and I realize some work is, is quite sensitive and so you might not be able to mention, but examples um, of cultural institutions in your experience being targeted during COVID um, during the lockdowns, even even thefts that were prevented. Well, I I, I feel like it's a interesting the 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 theft of Van Gogh pieces that you 
you, you posted the headline for recently, I, I kind of felt, I've, I've only just moved to the Netherlands and I kind mm -hmm. of felt the moment I get here, everything's just falling apart. Oh. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't think that was a, a particularly good look for that to happen just so quickly after that. It was, um, but, it was a matter of days, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was fast. Not, not, not great. Um, uh, but um, when it comes to increases in the appearance of illicit antiquities in various venues, um, on the one hand, that's not something I've been actively monitoring in the past few weeks. Um, but on the other hand, it, again, looking like thinking specifically of site looting to marketization, I wonder if like many aspects of this pandemic, it, it, it might be something that we only see the effects of a bit later on um, mm -hmm. as as objects move move from where they're going. So if, if there has been an increase in looting due to to COVID, we, we may just not not be seeing it so yeah. so quickly and if we did see it so quickly that would that would give us some really in, interesting information about yeah. how rapid the uh smuggling networks work and i'm i'm not sure they're quite that rapid but that that's an interesting research project for somebody to be doing yeah. right now if if anybody out there it needs a interesting at home master's thesis to write over the summer mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, I mean, we've seen news reports of, of sites in Israel, again, the Turkish example, these reports online. And as you mentioned, uh, I mean, both the research you've done, the research I've done on this as well, we're sometimes not seeing this, this stuff until 30 years after the fact, <laughs> figure out what happened. So to see it coming through in, in real time is, is rather staggering. Um, Vernon and Dennis, any, any thoughts on that since you're both on the, the front lines of this in a, a different capacity? I think, sorry, I, think from, I, I was I was muted because I had a, another call came in. Um, sorry, what was the question? Uh, just um, any any firsthand anecdotes or experiences that you've seen of of hair that's been thwarted that that you can talk about realizing um, some cannot be, but um, of of these fears being realized and, and pieces being targeted um, during these challenging times. Uh, personally, no, I don't think we've had any. Um, uh issues during this current um um pandemic um but then you know my area of uh, responsibility has has shrunken a little so uh uh i, I don't think i'm in a position to be able to give you any information on that okay. i think um from from my my fears are probably more about our archaeological sites um, and, and remote sites and, and it's very similar isn't it to when these countries are in conflict and uh, people are drawn away from those sites so those guardians are not there the security isn't there but also those projects the, the sort of projects we list in our culture in crisis portal most of these have stopped and that means that there's thousands or tens of thousands of people that have been pulled away from those and and I do fear that things will be stolen as they are when any of these sites are are, 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 are left un, unattended and that we probably won't find that out until uh, people go back in and then even maybe longer until those, those, uh, those audits are, are completed. Uh, and the thing from museums I think we have to be very careful is not to assume that just because uh, a theft happened during the lockdown that it was in some way the responsibility of the lockdown. I think actually when I look there's been a shift over the last few years of museum burglaries internationally from daytime uh, almost opportunistic burglaries to nighttime burglaries and this is probably more in my opinion to do with the financial situation and the reduction of nighttime security officers so um, you know that's a risk and it shouldn't be heightened because of, of, of COVID necessarily so we feared it at the beginning but when you look at it objectively that's not necessarily the case in fact because yeah. as dennis alluded to earlier it's very hard for a criminal to get away if there's you know if you walk out of the vna on a normal day with a painting under your arm you're going to walk <laughs> past hundreds of thousands of people um but you and you you can blend in pretty quickly um you know um into 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 uh, into the crowd um, but if you walk out now you're on the street on your own with, with the painting under your arm so it's it's difficult for you to, uh, to, to to maybe get away with that so I think I, I, I think we should not be too concerned about whether or not I think it'd be very hard for us to assess even if crimes do happen and some obviously have 
whether that's a direct consequence of COVID or actually whether it's the more general cuts and financial situation that sadly uh, so many cultural venues are facing. Yeah, and, and you raise a good point with that, which was it's it's a threat from, I mean, it, the threat started with COVID, but it's, kind, it's more the dominoes falling. And a statistic we've read here in the United States is that a shocking 30% of museums might not be able to financially reopen. Um, I know countries like Egypt that depend so much on site visits and the money that that brings in to protect these sites um, are facing huge shortfalls as well. And this is something, of course, that's going to have implications for archaeological site security, museum site security for years and uh, in fact beyond. Um, so yeah, with, with risk arguably going up and budgets going down due to the fact that we're in a global recession, how, how to, to handle this? I think this is where it's, you know, I fear more for the future than I do now because there will be a lot of cultural organizations will be in very dire financial positions for years and they will want to maintain their core business and they will want to preserve their collections but security is one of those areas that they will seek to cut in many in many cases and that will make us vulnerable for years to come um, rather than actually now the impact of the impact of this pandemic might really be felt over the next two three or even four years i, I think frontline security within museums are kind of the unsung heroes of 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 the museum world I, I i've said that before i'll say it again and it it is unfortunate that security so often appears on the chopping block that said of course everything is on the chopping block now i'm just musing i'm <laughs> um Unfortunately, uh, the, at, at the, the, the situation at archaeological sites will be similar to even potentially worse. Um, the, the smaller, more distant archaeological sites will potentially be, be losing various types of monitoring. The monitoring that comes from uh, archaeologists going to these archaeological sites to do work potentially won't be there. And then the when it comes to site looting and um, financial issues, um, we, we, we may be seeing this uptick in, in archaeological site looting six months from now, a year from now, when, when people really are in dire financial straits. A lot of really interesting, solid research uh, ties archaeological site looting to economic depression and the loss of, of legitimate income streams. So moving away from opportunistic criminals exploiting uh, this potential crisis and move towards people who, who find six months from now that they, they can't potentially feed their family because of the, the recession that we're in. And um, like Vernon, I, I fear a bit more for the future than, than the immediate. Mm. And it's yeah, not, so, it's not just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bernard. I'm sorry, it's not just the frontline security officers, the, 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 the support services that we need, just, you know, the upkeep of places, the fact that mm. we know that, uh, that the premises and sites that are well kept and clean and tidy, yeah. um, give the impression that they're also more secure, um, cleaning regimes will cut. Um, uh, security now totally relies upon IT networks. These, these sort of back of house infrastructure things, a state and IT are fundamental to, to all of our operations. And again, there are areas where these, these cuts will inevitably be made. Um, and it's just balancing this and at the same time creating a, a, a message so that, that, so that we're not leaving these uh, sites and uh, museums vulnerable for years. Dennis, as someone who's, who's worked um, in law enforcement, as in military police, and then in museum security, and now in the private sector, I was wondering how you've had a lot of different perspectives looking at this from different angles. And so we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what's different in the private sector, what's the same, what's true across the board, what's not. I think what's uh, similar is you have to have a voice and you have to explain the rationale as to why uh, the security measures that you are advising and need to be funded are fit for purpose and appropriate and you're not just spending the money because you, you, you think it uh, 
makes you uh, a, a more important person. I, I think that you have to have clarity to the people who have the purse strings to explain why this is a good idea, why this is a good spend. You have to have the capability of being able to explain to them that the reverse of doing it, as Vernon has said, actually will cost you more money in the long run. So it is good economic sense to have effective um, and practical security. And, and the, the point that it's, it's always the security, the cleaning and, and those elements that, that tend to uh, suffer, I, I think it's not, not entirely my experience that that is the case, not so much these days. And I think if you present a good case and you explain why it's good value for money, then uh, you should you should be okay. Uh, yeah. I think the difference between the public sector and the private sector is uh, you do have to be very clear about what it is that you are going to spend and why, and and explain to the uh, to the bean counters uh, why that is a, a, an appropriate measure. Yeah. I think in the in the public sector uh, there is. Uh, there, there is a finite amount of money and that's it. You don't really sort of get much of an opportunity to, to extend your, uh, your needs. If, if things change, you've got to make do and mend as a, as a lot of the cases. And sorry, I, I didn't want to suggest that um, security would be disproportionately uh, affected, but I think museums and cultural venues after this will become smaller organisations. They will have to work in a different way. There was a report in the art newspaper earlier, which sort of picks up the idea that, you know, attendance at the museum might drop to something like 15 to 30 percent of its original attendance level. That means that we will have to make cuts across the board. The whole organisation will get smaller. Um, but what doesn't get smaller is a responsibility for looking after the same amount of objects during the same number of, uh, of hours of the day. And so, you know, I would, I, I don't, uh, I don't fear that, that uh, certainly not here, you know, we're, we're very well supported with, mm -hmm. with security. They really understand the, the need for it. But, it, but it's inevitable looking across the globe that organisations will, will have to reduce uh, to what is already in very, very many cases a pared down uh, service as, as it is. And indeed, they'll be thinking not just about the security of objects, but the conservation of objects and all these other factors so that security becomes one voice competing for, and I hate to say it like that, competing, but competing for a, a, a shrinking uh, pot of funding and um, yeah. shrinking uh, capacity for staff or staff capacity. So. Yeah, no, to, to, to focus on sites, I mean, as, as everyone has mentioned today, again, security uh, of archaeological sites is often woefully underfunded. I read a statistic yesterday here in the United States that on our, our federal and federally controlled lands, there's usually one person with this responsibility per million acres, million acres, and um, Obviously, in other countries, um, the United States is a comparatively rich country, so, so think of what that situation must be elsewhere. Um, I did want to read a comment from, from the chat um, from Dr. Manfil Dante, whom many of you may know from his work with, with ASOR. Um, and he, he writes, there have been bold incidents of looting during the pandemic in northern Iraq that have been thwarted by the authorities and to assist um, their program at Penn has been conducting emergency projects, including new vehicles for site monitoring, establishing site guards, additional cameras, et cetera. So, so here's, you know, confirmation that this, this is, is indeed, you know, some of these fears at least are coming to pass. Um, Donna, you mentioned that the greatest threat to sites, you know, this is not going to be something that, that stops with the end of the lockdown. And, and you mentioned as the economy gets worse, we're going to see more of this. I um, also know that from the, the recession in Greece, for instance, looting increased a great deal. And what was also interesting that the people who were caught, at least, which we all know is the, the tip of the iceberg, most of them were first-time offenders. These, these were people who, who got into it because of, of the recession. Um, but we're seeing, you know, all these changes in real time. You know, air travel being down, for instance, means it's, that's one smuggling route that perhaps is out, that you have fewer people traveling on airplanes. And so perhaps that's increasing shipping through things like FedEx or the Post, um, selling 
offline since people can't sell in, you sell in person. For, for you or, the, or Dennis or Vernon, especially given your work in law enforcement, um, yeah, does, how, is, is law enforcement going to be able to adjust as, as quickly as these criminals have? And um, what, what opportunities are there for fighting, particularly the trafficking era of, of things as opposed to the actual looting on the ground, but once these, these objects are in the market and circulating? One, one of my current concerns is, as an ap academic, can I adjust? <laughs> um, the, the project you mentioned when you're introducing me um, has a strong focus on looking at smuggling pathways, and it literally started in January of this year to run for five years, and is, is meant to kind of follow objects as they move through um, their different pathways. Won't go too far into that, but uh, I'm coming to terms with the idea that the, the pathways that I'm meant to be looking at are definitely different now and maybe have fundamentally changed um, yeah. in, in, in the near future, not just because the world changes, but because uh, traffickers forced to innovate, maybe find innovative new ways to traffic. Um, yeah. The, the question I'm asking myself is, is, is what I plan to look at still there? So it's a little bit of a back to the drawing board um, uh, for, for my approach. Um, but I would, I'd love yeah. to hear what Dennis and Vernon think about uh, uh, approaches to detecting this and what, what might be coming from a, a, a boots on the ground law enforcement angle. Well, I think, I think, I think there's been like, leaps and bounds made in the last, you know, certainly in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, you know, with the likes of the Antiquities Coalition and, and other uh, very passionate people to raising awareness of, of the of the issues about the sources of some of this material. And I think that is probably the biggest defence is uh, educating the potential uh, purchaser, the potential um, individuals who might want these things on their shelves or on their bookcases, that it's just not a good thing to do. Uh, and I think 10 or 15 or maybe 20 years ago, that probably wasn't uh, as um, prominent in people's minds. Um, that, you know, there may be people on the participants list that would actually uh, dispute that and there may be statistics to indicate that that isn't the case. Um, but from, from my perception, people do tend to have an awareness and if they still continue to do it, then th that is, uh, you know, th that is do they're doing it because they've got mal intent. Whereas I think 20 or 30 years ago, they might have been less um, educated about it and less uh, capable of making um, reasoned judgment calls. I Dennis, think, I wanted uh, to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Vernon. Sorry, I was just. I was just going to say, you can. Um, when you're looking at smuggling routes, you can compare it to the experiences of other areas of criminality as well. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see at the moment that there is a reduction in drugs coming into, certainly into the UK. And look at the impact that that has had on on crime. It's driven up prices because people still need drugs, and that has fueled a certain, a different type of crime which is needed to pay for those drugs. And I think what we can look at here is. You know, we almost certainly know that the looting will still be taking place. It may well have increased. Um, it, it probably has increased. What's probably decreased is that coming into our countries uh, at, the, at the moment because those routes are difficult. And however adaptable smugglers and criminals are, they are probably struggling to bring that material in. And what we saw after sort of bulk thefts in the past as well, they need to bring it in slowly because otherwise there's too much of it and the price drops. So they need to feed it into the market. So I think it's going to be really important for law enforcement, uh, customs, border force and particularly to start monitoring uh, the, the movement of goods at the trade and, and expect that there is probably warehouses full of looted material, sadly, that is then going to be fed into us as market countries uh, over a period of time. And that's our opportunity uh, to try and get on top of it and to try and intercept it. But sadly, it doesn't stop the theft in the first place from, from the sites yeah. and the loss of that content that's suffered. Yeah. Something else that's been raised in the, um, in the chat and the Q&A is a, a question, uh, particularly for you, you, Vernon and Dennis, uh, though Donna would, it's, I think you'll be interested in this question as well. 
of, of a challenge that you know, many of us didn't think about at first with COVID, and that's the fact that your museum going public are all going to be dressed like bandits wearing masks, which makes it yes. hard to see huh. people. Um, <laughs> difficult. I mean, if you have footage of them, how much help is, is that? I mean, is, what, what can be done about, about this? This seems like it would be a hugely challenging issue facing security professionals across the board right now. I love that. I love the the idea that you know uh, the usually they're dressed in high vis vests and not not looking like criminals. Now everybody looks like a criminal with their bandit bandanas. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there's lots of conversations been going on about this, particularly in uh, in the likes of high end jewelry stores and things like that, about uh, asking people to remove their masks, their face coverings. We're, we're not calling them masks as such um on on entry uh, and then replacing them uh, so that there is mm. some capture i think that's almost untenable to try and uh, and achieve that with the sort of numbers that uh, museums might be getting but you know if you've got a one-on-one -on -one in a bond street jewelers you may well be able to do that but mm. i think i think it's just one of those things if the um subsequent evidence proves otherwise and that somebody used the concept of wearing a mask to hide their criminality the likelihood is they would have done it anyway i think the research that some people have done is that criminals don't really care much about cctv they're not that concerned about it they're more concerned as vernon said about the the person that's standing next to them to the about the members of the public around they they they're much more comfortable about disputing video evidence and cctv evidence than eyewitness evidence mm. so I, I think it's it's an interesting uh point but i think it's it's a risk that is very low on our agenda yeah i, I totally Until agree. it happens we don't... of course and then we'll we'll raise it <laughs> museums want to encourage people to come to them and whether we wear masks or not and actually you know there's a there's a good chance that museums when they open in the uk might not insist on masks some some might some might not but it would be totally disproportionate to ask people to pull the mask down and film their face. I said earlier, one in 11 and a half million visitors to the museum come with criminal intent. So all of these things have got to be done on a straightforward risk assessment. What is the risk and is the action proportionate? And, you know, yes, it's different. And, and lots of descriptions of criminals will be wearing a small blue mask as, he, as they run off down the street. Um, <laughs> but but not, not, from, not from museums. You know, we've got to look at it and our our intention is to open up and be welcoming and to try and encourage people back into the museum because we need people in the museums to function and for the other sorts of security. I think the last thing we want to be doing is putting people off by subjecting them to sort of very overt and, and uh, maybe slightly intrusive um, uh, security levels when they come back. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So we have, we just have four minutes left. Um, and so I, I did want to end on actually a few questions that we've received all on the same topic through the Q&A and that actually all three of you have mentioned during your comments today. And this is the role of demand and driving fine art theft and driving archaeological looting. People will not be looting sites or stealing paintings if there is no one to buy them. Um, and so is, is now particularly, you know, is, is it up to all of us to, to educate the buying public on, on how to buy these items responsibly, how to, um, you know, what, what is the rule of demand here and how can we use these challenging times to, to address it, which will hopefully help in the, the long term in addressing all of these problems we've discussed today. Well, I, I, I can't begin to understand why somebody would try to steal a museum painting um, because I, I'm, I'm not sure what the demand really is for that. Um, doesn't seem like a good idea for me <laughs> on my side, but I'm sure uh, Vernon and Dennis might have more to say about that. Um, but uh, when, when it comes to theft at archeological sites, there's, there's no reason anybody would subject themselves to the tortures of digging up archeological sites unless they're an academic archeologist or a professional archeologist or um, there, there was a financial benefit to it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there's no, nowhere to sell these items, if, if there isn't some money at the end of the chain, 
well, why would anybody do this? It's really hard and often hot or wet or terrible. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not that fun. <laughs> um, so when it, when it comes to the role of, of demand, um, the, I and my colleagues on the Trafficking Culture Project, um, most of our research seems to show that demand for these objects creates the market. That's, that's where, where, where the smuggling networks form. Um, and it is unfortunate that there are many spheres of the market where the levels of provenance and um, th that would be required to show that an object that it, it is viable, um, that, that they're just not required within those spheres. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think Dennis is absolutely right when he said before that um, awareness raising has increased magnificently in the past decade or so maybe maybe a little bit more. And I, I, I completely agree with him that that's, that's, that's where we can actually make some real difference. Um, uh, dealing with the social aspects of demand, um, kind of listening to the market, talking to the market, and, and kind of thinking through ways to collaboratively meet the desires of, of the market while not creating the demand for the illicit material that really does fuel the looting. Um, and the Antiquities Coalition is great at that. And um, yeah. And so, yeah, no, so yes, please go ahead. Sorry, uh, there's maybe another, another demand at the moment as well, and, and not just financial demand, but there's uh, something that I'm obviously looking at for when museums reopen, and our museum in particular, is the, is the demand for action at the moment. The fact that people are not taking off just because of their financial uh, value, but because they think those objects should not be on display for a reason, or they think they should be returned to a different country, they should be removed and, or recontextualized. And I think, I think that demand is, is something that we're seeing. I don't know if it's a direct consequence of, of, of the COVID lockdown, but it strikes me that with most museums having furloughed nearly three quarters of their staff, um, there's, a, there's a lot of very well-informed, well-educated people who are pressing for change and demanding action. And so that in itself is creating uh, another security risk, certainly for, for museums uh, going, going forward. And we're not actually at the hour, but Dennis, I, I wanted to make sure you didn't have a, a final comment before we, we close this down. Um, all I can say is that I know from being on the inside of the market looking out, that there are a lot of really hardworking people within the market that are absolutely dedicated to ensuring that the material that does come onto the market is legitimate, it's been properly researched, uh, and it's within, within the legislation that, uh, that is applicable to it. Uh, I, 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 there is always a, uh, a flip comment that everybody's quite cavalier about these things, but that hasn't been my experience. I think they're a very dedicated uh, legal and research people within our organizations that that make that, that that effort the historical pieces as Vernon has said there's 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 very little that uh, that you can give a simple answer to in relation to you know Benin sculptures or or, or, or Greek sculptures that that has to be a uh, a national debate about those things but that's that's not, I don't think, a driver in relation to the nuts and bolts uh, looting of, of sites. I think that's a much more base level. Uh, somebody was talking to me a couple of weeks ago about areas of Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, where there are huge areas that were badly affected during the Second World War uh, between um, the Nazis and the, and the uh, USSR troops. And the, their landscape is literally being completely dug up by mm -hmm. what they call night hawks, who are illegal um, metal detectorists, but they're decimating farmland. They're creating a, 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 a nightmare of, of a landscape. It, and this is in Europe within, yeah. uh, the, and also very dangerous because a lot of them are blowing themselves up. But, you know, that's, uh, that's a very sad um, uh, element to it. So I think my, my point on that is that everybody is putting together on it and there are people out there who are genuinely concerned that these things happen and it's about the holistic approach, about making sure that, that the people who are 
gigging them up have got alternative opportunities and that the, 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 the sellers and the buyers are all educated in, in, in what is what is right and what is wrong. I, I think there will always be a market. There will always be an area where people will want to collect material. Uh, it's just making sure that it's appropriate. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and, you and, and, and thank all of you. I think that is an optimistic note to end on in that the, the market has come a long way in a comparatively short period of time. And it seems like we're all in agreement that one way to address a host of these problems, whether it's letting people know that, no, there's not really a market for stealing Rembrandts or, you know, don't steal this antiquity. So much of this is, is public outreach and talking to one another and, and moving forward with difficult conversations to find a common ground. Um, thank you again so much to our attendees today for sharing an hour of your, your time with us and also especially to our panelists from I think we have four countries on um, here with, with us today. And um, we're so grateful that you joined us. And we, it's our pleasure to invite you to our next webinar. Please save the date for this. Um, we're going to be looking at the path of uh, American treasure through the, the licit and the illicit market. That will be on Tuesday, June 30th. At 11, we do hope to see you there as we speak to David Howard, who is the author of the book Lost Rights, which again traces a stolen copy of the Bill of Rights um, through numerous adventures over the years. Thank you all again. We appreciate you joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Hey, bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>